All right. So welcome to 24 Hours of STEM. Glad Thank to you. have you. Um, we're excited to hear what you have to show us and say today. So awesome. why don't you introduce yourself and... Okay, yeah. Yes, um, my name is Jason. My name is Jason Feinstein. I work at Google as a software engineer. Um, and on my weekends, uh, I like to play with hot metal. So <laughs> uh, we're going to do a bit of blacksmithing. Um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll go through uh, what the tools are that we use for blacksmithing, um, the different um, operations you can apply to the metal to get it to move in the way that you want it to move. Um, and then talk a bit about how you would put those operations together in order to make something that you, you want to make. Because it's really important to get the, the order of those operations correct. Otherwise, you end up kind of getting in your own way when you're doing blood blocks and I think loosely that can apply to, to working with robotics. Like if you're making something that it needs to you know go across the room and shoot something into a hoop, um, you need to make sure that you do things in the right order to make sure you can get the basket. Um, so uh, first of all, I guess we can go through the tools. Um, they're all kind of equally important here. Uh, it's kind of like the triangle of tools that you need for blacksmithing. We have the forge, which we'll light up here in a second. Uh, actually, I'll light it up now. Um, so the forge, this one runs on propane. A lot of them uh, run on coal or um, sometimes wood. Uh, propane is easy for me just because I live in the city and I don't want to have a bunch of coal smoke going around and annoying my neighbors. But uh, what I'm gonna do is open up this burner so we get some oxygen flow. I'm going to start the gas. And then with the burner. So we need to let it warm up here uh, before I turn it up to full blast. It's going to warm up to somewhere around 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit before we crank it up more. Um, and while that's happening, let's go over the other, the other two most important tools, the hammer. This is, it's called a rounding hammer. Uh, those who want to get a little closer in. Uh, there's two faces to this. There's a flat face and a rounded face. Um, and even the flat face has different facets to it. Um, what these allow you to do is focus the impact on the, the metal into different kind of cross sections of what you're hitting. So you can direct the forces to be able to move metal in different directions. Um, and then the round side kind of allows you to do that as well. Um, it gives you a lot more freedom in terms of how you hit those, the metal, so you can kind of steer it as you're hitting it. And when you hit metal, if you were just to have kind of a stick and you just hit it like this, you're not really going to do much. Uh, you need to be able to hit against something, and that's the purpose of the anvil. The anvil serves as um, something that reflects the energy from the hammer back into the workpiece. Um, so what you end up doing is basically using uh, the fact that every action has an equal and opposite reaction to hit the, the workpiece, have the workpiece hit the anvil, and have the anvil hit the workpiece back. And what that lets you do is squeeze the metal. And really black something mostly comes down to squeezing metal in different ways. Um, we can get into a bit of like the different techniques for, for how you can squeeze metal here in a second. Um, but this is starting to heat up. I'm going to crank it up a little bit more. We'll let it get up to temperature. While that's happening, um, maybe we could do, are there any questions? Uh, I don't believe we have any questions right now, um, okay. but I'm sure we will uh, by the end of this. Um, sure. A, a question I personally have is, uh, how hot does your forge actually get? Do you know like um, a estimate in temperature? Yeah, so this forge will get, if I crank it as, up as high as it'll go safely, um, it will get up to what's called forge welding temperature, which is where it's hot enough to be able to take two pieces of steel and um, hit them together to make them weld. So kind of like you do arc welding, this is the original way you would do welding. Um, and that temperature is it's usually between 2200 and 2400 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I don't know what the Celsius is for that, sorry. Um, but where we'll be working at today, I think will be closer to 2000, maybe 1800 degrees. 
All right. Going that hot for forge welding is a little bit rough on the forge itself. Um, those temperatures start to break down the insulation on the side. So. All right, now that we're up to a temperature I think we can start working with. What I'll do is I'll go over the, the, six, the six operations you can apply while you're forging. Um, the first one is tapering. You can take a piece of steel and taper it out into a longer piece of steel. The opposite of that is called upsetting, where you take uh, a long piece of steel and you squish it down to make it wider and shorter. Uh, next up would be um, uh, you can cut metal. So cutting metal, you can either do it with power tools or at the anvil, which we'll do later. Um, you can also bend the metal, so that would be taking a hot piece of metal and either hitting it over the side of the anvil or putting it in uh, a vise like this and using a uh, tong to bend it around the vise. Uh, and then twisting is another one. So if you have uh, a piece kind of like this, which I made a while ago, you can take a square piece, put it in the vise, and use a tool to twist it into a helix. Um, pretty nice for decorative purposes. Uh, I guess you could also make like a, a screw if you wanted to. Um, and then forge welding. Forge welding is one we're not going to do today. Uh, again, because it gets quite hot. And I'm also not very good at it. I'm a much better software engineer than I am with blacksmith. Uh, so bear with me as we go through. Um, let's go ahead and show you tapering. So. Right here we have, um, this is three eighths inch round stock. This is called mild steel. Uh, mild steel just means that it's low in carbon. Um, so like the kitchen knives that you have in your house, those are usually high carbon steel. And what high carbon steel lets you do is um, it's hardness. And that's really important for knives and other things with blades because that's what keeps the blades uh, sharp. Um, for mild steel, it doesn't harden, but it does work very easily and you can make nice shapes out of it. Um, also, it's a lot less expensive, so it's great for practicing with. Um, and we'll go ahead and put this into the forge. Unless you want to get closer. So let's let that come up to temperature. Hey, I'm getting rained on. I'm in Seattle, so we have very stereotypical Seattle weather today. We're going to wait for the, the metal to get up to about an orange color in temperature. Um, color translates pretty well to temperature for black sensing, so um, it'll start off as obviously kind of a, a grayish black color. It uh, goes into a deep kind of cherry red, uh, then transitions to more of a red orange, a deeper orange, and you get closer and closer to yellow. And then um, as you get into the really hot temperatures, it becomes yellow and it even will start to spark. And we really want to avoid that. Sparking is great if you're going to forge weld because it's hot enough to where you can do that welding operation. But um, if you go too much past that, steel can actually burn. And that's what is a sign of the steel burning. Like the spark, the spark is coming off. So it looks like we're at a good kind of orangey yellow. It should work really well. So what we're going to do. Um, so we'll show tapering. So what I'm going to do here is use the anvil. Uh, in the hammer and direct the force on the tip of this material kind of in, in even ways, pinching it between the anvil and the hammer to create a point on the end of this. So it's really good to work in as like four sides, hard to make it round and pointy all at once. 
And if you want to do, you can put a, a round point on it. Again, once you have four sides, then what you can do is knock the corners off and turn it into an octagon. Now we have that kind of an octagon cross section. And you can continue knocking the corners off until so you eventually get like a nice kind of point on the end. This one's not super straight, but if we put it back down on the anvil to where the, the high part is up and hit it just that way, you can start to straighten it out a bit. This is called tapering. Upsetting would be the opposite. So what we do is you'd want to set up the material so that you're hitting it uh, parallel to the material, so perpendicular to the cross section. So you uh, smoosh it into itself to make it wider. Um, bending is the other one that we'll do, or another one we'll do. So once this heats back up. I can balance it here. I realize I'm not wearing safety glasses. That was bad. Right. Right, so we're coming back up to temperature. There's a number of ways that you can bend the material. You can either do it on the anvil. So if I want to put a 90 degree bend in this, I'll put it against the anvil and I'll hit on just on the outside of the anvil. So you can see the force from my hammer is going to go down, the force from the anvil is going to go up and it's going to push over the material. Right? And then you can kind of work it into the side like that. And now we've got a bit of a bend. Um, another way you could do it is to put it in, the, in a vise. And maybe I can bend it back. So put it in the vise like this. A little bit tall for the screen in here. But this also demonstrates why it's important to think about the order you do things when you're black building. Because it's really hard to undo something. So I bent that 90 degrees in there, and it's more difficult than just trying to bend it back the other way to get it straight again. There we go. Uh, fix, the, fix the issue there. So that was bending. So we've done tapering. We talked about upsetting. Uh, we did a bend. Um, now what we'll do is we'll cut off this tip so we have a fresh start for the next thing that we'll, we'll work on. Um, and that'll get into where we have to kind of plan out what we're trying to do. So the first thing that we'll actually make here is going to be a, a hook put on the wall. So I have a bunch of them in, in my workshop. So, um, oops. <laughs> Don't start a fire, Jason. Okay. So examples are all over here. I go like this hook, this one here. Um, and, and what we need to do is figure out what we need to do like, of those operations we just talked about to make this. Obviously, there's a point on there. So we're going to have to do some kind of tapering out and drawing out of a point. Um, there's clearly a bend. There's another bend here. Because we, we don't want there to be a really sharp point. For, you know, if it's hanging on the wall and you trip and fall. You don't want to stab yourself on nothing you make for yourself. Um, so it's nice to have a bit of a blunt edge here. Also, we're eventually going to cut it off with the material. So we've got this long rod here. We don't want to have a hook that fast that day. Um, so let's cut it off. And then we need to make a little backing plate that we can drill a hole in for the screw in that will go on the wall. Um, the question is, what order do we do those? Um, Cutting it off the bar first wouldn't really work very well. So then we'd have a teeny tiny piece that we would then need another tool to hold up, like to hold on to it with. Um, and we 
we do have that tool. We've got some tongs here. But I don't want to do the entire operation using tongs. It's much easier just to hold on to the box. So we'll, we'll save cutting for later in the operation. Also, we've got these two bends. If I did this bend first and then try to do this one, it'd be really difficult to try to kind of get in there with the hammer and kind of curl over this tip as at this bend. Because if this is here and I try to do it at the same time, I'm going to end up messing this up. So I think what it means we need to do is uh, just curl on the tip before we do the big bend. Um, and additionally, we have the curl on the tip, but it's also kind of tapered out. This is a little bit of a bad example. It's not exactly the cleanest cup. Um, but it's that tapered to the tip, kind of like a little bit nicer. But we have to do that before we do the curl. So our order of operations for this is going to be Draw out the taper, so you have this one, basically a pointy stick. Uh, then we need to do the little curl. Then we need to do the big bend. Then we need to cut it off, and then we'll make the backing plate. And the backing plate will be the only only operation that I need to do with tongs. We'll get started. So I think we're plenty hot now. First, I'm going to cut off cut off the edge to start fresh. Exactly. Hey, there you go. Over to where it's not going to burn anything. Back up. So we're move this. this is called a, a hot cut hardy. So this part of the anvil is called the hardy hole. I don't know why. That's just what it's been called for like 150 years. Um, and this, that you can, what you can do is make tools that go in this hole. This is one of them. So this has a just a bit of a blade. It's really, really dull, but it's sharp enough for when the metal is really hot. You can use it to cut the metal. Which is what I just did, and we'll do that again. But um, it just fits in there. And you get the material over the Hot Example of another tool that goes in this hole. One that I made is this. It was called a spring puller. And this is used with material between these two parts here to be able to get semicircular indentations on whatever you're working on on both, on both sides at the same time. So, this is another tool. Okay, how are we doing here? All right, we're all set. So remember, for the hook, we're going to draw the taper. We're going to put that little curly Q pigtail thing on the end. Uh, then we'll do the big bend. Then we'll cut it off. And then we'll make the backing plate for the screen. So the first up is that, that taper. Again, we're working with an anvil and a hammer. If I hit the corner on the top, 
the anvil is also hitting the other corner on the opposite side. So it's important to have your, the material be fairly symmetrical, so that way you can take advantage of the fact that the anvil is hitting the material as well as the hammer. So I'm going to roll it as I hit it. Nice and circular, as circular as we can get with hand tools. I don't know if you can see that. It's a little bit cleaner now. That's a taper. The next step is um, the little curly cue, whatever you want to call it. And I'm thinking with the amount of heat that we'll have in the, in the material here, we should have enough time to do the curly cue, and then if we're really fast, also do the bend uh, to make the actual hook. So I'm gonna make sure we're all set up for success there. Um, and we'll make sure it's clean. Maybe about 15 seconds. I'm going to go really fast. I'll try to talk what I'm doing again. All right. Let me show you what I'm going to do is hold the tip over the edge of the anvil just a little bit and kind of brush, brush down. I'm a little bit flattening it out. That's not the great, but that'll get the, the point across. And I'm just gently kind of rounding off the tip there. And I'm going to cool it down so that way it's colder than the rest of the material next to it. So I can actually hit it. And I'm going to bend the other way to make the hook it's looking pretty good. I think we can probably clean it up with the horn. But also, you know, you're not finding the right angles and parts of the anvil to use. That's a little funky. not too bad. It could be better, but I think that works for our purposes. Now it's kind of like we have a bit of a, I don't know, you can make a bunch of these and put them in your yard and put like strands off them and have a fence or something. But I don't know what we're do. Okay, to recap, we've tapered, we've made the curly cue, we've made the other bend, we made two bends. Um, now what we need to do is actually cut off the hook. We're going to cut it off and then begin to flatten out the part that we'll drill the hole in for uh, the screw. And because we, when we cut it off, we can't, we don't want to touch that with our bare hands. Uh, we're going to use tongs to, uh, to hold on to it after we cut it off. And we're going to cut it again with a tongue cut. One of the ways that you can tell if a blacksmith is any good at what they're doing is how many times it takes them, or how many times they need to reheat the material as they're working on something. A really good blacksmith could probably make this whole hook in just one heat. They would heat it up to that orangey red, orangey yellow color the first time, then the taper, the curl, the bend, the cut, and, the, and making the back plate all in one go. And here it's clearly it's taking me like four or five times. Okay, I think we're ready to cut it off. Our hook. What I'm going to do is put it kind of a little bit over the edge. I'm going to angle it down and then I'll hit right over the blade. You see there's a bit of a wedge there. I don't want to go all the way through because I don't want to hit my hammer on the plate. It's not really great for it. So I'll go until we're pretty far and then I'll use the, the tongue. And just kind of wiggle until it comes apart. I'll cool this down. Okay. 
So now let's switch my example hook. There we go. So what we're going to do now is create this part. How can we do that? We need to be able to ensure that we have a bit of a lift here. We want to make this part really flat. So, again, using the, the anvil to our advantage, we can use the corner of the anvil to make that lift. And if we hold it like this, hit down here, what will happen is the hammer will hit this side, so it'll start to spread it out, and the anvil, the corner of the anvil, will push in and create that that little wedge. But it's far too cold. Let's put it back in the corner. Author, my coworker for being my camera guy today. Looks like it got pretty cold out. It's been there explaining. It's going to take 10, 15 more seconds for a probably make that a bit thinner. Um, so I'll do that. One more heat. How are we on time? Pretty good. You have about a half an hour left. And uh, I'd say probably um, 25, 20, if, assuming you want to answer some questions at the end. Finish this up. Um, we might be able to. We'll see if we can rush through making another project here in a second. Um, so, on my keychain, I have this little leaf, little key fob. Um, and we can talk about the operations that we would need to use to make this leaf. It's going to be a lot of like bending again to get this little stem, of course. Uh, We'll have to do some tapering. We'll have to make sure that we uh, isolate the material correctly so that when we make the leaf, we don't end up squishing the rest of the, the, the stem. Um, and we can probably get it started, see if we can finish it up. Flattening, flattening the top so pretty nice and thin. Could be more even if it was better at what I'm doing. I probably wouldn't have that little like lump, like lopsided thing up there, but we can clean that up with a grinder too. Um, I think we're just about done with this. So I'm gonna put it in the water. Actually, it should straight. Uh, straight. Yeah, 
down. I don't know if you can hear that. Sizzling. Close so it's totally off the hull. Um, and then now it's just a matter of spinning it up and making it ready to use. So what you do here um, is uh, grind it down, kind of make it shiny, uh, put on some clear coat. That'd be one thing you could do. Or you could heat it back up and put these wax on to give it a nice flat back finish. Um, and then be able to drill a hole in it. Yeah, there's a hook. Get started on that. I'll leave it With that leaf, we have the leaf itself, which is going to be made out of a taper. Um, but that taper needs to be wider than the rest of the material that we end up making the stem out of. So, what we're going to do is put kind of a pyramid on the end of the bond to get that. So we can turn that into a leaf later on. We will take about a chunk of the material behind that pyramid and separate it from the rest of the, the bar in a way that um, will mean that as we're working on stretching the stem out, we're not messing up the leaf, and then when we get to flat the leaf, we're not messing up the I'm not going to need the tongs for a while. to form the point, the initial point for that end of the leaf. So we're going to go cut off a tiny little bit here. And I'm going to try and cut evenly around the four sides so we have a little bit of a pyramid, more or less, left over. Pyramid in the world, but we'll fix that. I'll drop that in the water. Yeah. 
use another example of probably this is probably more close to the size that we're making. Hopefully I'll be able to do a better job than I did that time. Going to continue hitting that lump of material over the edge of the angle, trying to isolate it. Until we get down to where that neck that I'm making is about half the width. Yeah, that's not right. About half the width of the angle. And then I'll use that um, over this side of the angle. Start isolating the parts that we're going to use to make. We had a reason that I moved it just to one corner that way is so that I can work on this side here without hitting it into the handle. So that I'm hitting here, I'm not hitting this lump into the handle. So I'm creating that offset. Uh, this way on the, on the tip, and then this way on the base. So when I can rotate it 90 degrees and not uh, run into myself. So uh, while we're waiting for the metal to heat up again, do we have time for a quick question? Sure. All right. Uh, what item or tool are you most proud of smithing? So I've made a lot of the tools that are back here. Um, this one I'm pretty proud of. This is a punch. So what you do is you have a large piece of material um, and you can hold this with one hand and hit with the, the hammer on the other side and it's kind of punching a, a hole into some pretty hefty material. So I've used it to punch a hole in this uh, inch and a quarter. Um, also the tongs are a lot of fun. Um, this is a pair of tongs that I made. Impressive, thank you. Yeah. I'll probably answer some more questions while I'm doing this, if you want. All right, well, we have another quick break. Uh, got another question. Um, okay. how, how long did it take you to learn uh, to smith things like this? And uh, on a side note, what project took you the longest to make? Okay, um, so I've been doing black smithing as a hobby for like two years now, so not very long. Um, I took a class at the local community college um, where I was living, I used to live in Texas um, and, and in Austin, and there was a community college there that had uh, intro to black thing classes, um, and in that class, actually, they teach us how to make, they taught us how to make uh, the hooks, as well as um, the fireplace poker. Uh, and then I kind of got the bug there and went on eBay and tried to find an anvil, uh, the hammer, and stuff like that. And uh, well, the other question was, what was the, the most involved project? The longest. Um, Good question. Probably these tongs. So each each of the components here started as just 
six inches of, of material that's three quarters round. And it's, it's not just regular mild steel, this is um, it's called chromoly steel or um, 4142, 4140. Um, so it has decent carbon content, which makes it a little harder to work with. Um, and so taking that six to eight inches of three quarter inch round material and drawing out the rain with the tongue and then drawing out the actual head um, took just way longer than anything to do. All right, I'm just going to continue working on stretching out the uh, stem of the leaf. Uh, yeah. Um, another question is, how many tools or items uh, have you made that you either use in your shop or have around with you? Um, I don't know the number, but we can go look through some of them. So all of these kind of striking tools are things that I've made. Um, and then some drip. So this is called a drift. What this is used is when you have a hole in the material and you want to make the hole bigger or into a certain shape, you use this to stretch the hole out in different ways. Um, these are punches and things called pullers. So this is a puller. We'll actually use this when we leave. Let's figure this out. Um, a whole bunch of those types of things. This is called a if it was a good one, it would be called a swage. This is a really bad example. I just need something real quick. That's a good piece of material sent to put the indentations in. Um, I'm not sure how many are there. I made one knife in my house. A number of bottle openers. Yeah, a whole bunch of bottle openers. I made those as Christmas gifts. Um, and then a bunch of hooks. Yeah, the hooks are really useful in the workshop, even in the house. Uh, I've made hooks out of uh, railroad ties, or railroad spikes, not ties. Um, that have a whole bag full of just rusty old railroad spikes. These are really nice to turn, like make cool stuff out of. Um, yeah. All right. We're just about done stretching out the, the stem here. I was going to turn it into a little bit rounder. It's kind of going fast too, if you want to be able to make sure there's time for more questions. Now we can make the actual head of the leaf, which I'll do by just taking that cross section and smashing it down. So it's a little bit cold, but I just want to put it back into the finish. But we'll continue doing that some more. One of the things I really want to be able to make someday is my own hammer. This is a hammer I bought from um, a forge in Kentucky. Uh, it's just 
Duke Brothers, I think, and they, they make these uh, with what are called power hammers, so it's uh, uh, electric power, I think it's either electric or um, steam power <laughs> hammer uh, to move this kind of material, but you can make them by hand. And so what I want to do is make tools that are required to make a hammer. Um, and that's actually, this is one of them. I was working on another one a while back, so this would be a fuller. This is like going to be a handled version of one of these, which we'll use in a second here. Um, several other tools you have to make. This is this. It's for making the eye of the hammer. And actually, these tongs are really good for holding big material in the hammer. You can really see the leaf setting and take shape now. I've got a decently looking leaf head, and I'm going to put just some artistic little dents in it. Look a little bit like veins, but they're going, you know, they're indentations. So they're not popping out like veins on a really So this fuller has a rounded tip that lets me create. Ten more minutes. We okay, probably just have about five minutes until this is done, and then have questions. The next step, now we've got the, the leaf head and we have the stem drawn out, we need to actually separate it from the rest of the material um, and then create that, that bit of a, a loop so that we can use it as a huge two pile. And the way that I'm going to separate it from this material can be a little bit different from using the hardy. What I'll do is I'll just keep tapering it down so it's really, really thin and then be able to just twist it off the bar. So I'm going to get my tongs ready. These different depth tongs. Done with four. I just want to make this part thinner and thinner and thinner.
Uh, I do have one question here. Sure. Um, so I know you've made a lot of projects, but uh, what are the smallest and biggest ones you've ever made? And which one was more difficult? Hmm. The knife is pretty small, the knife that I've made. It's like a little paring knife for the kitchen. And that was by far the hardest thing that I've made, uh, just because uh, the forging is not that bad. So the forging is kind of similar to the leaf, actually. You take the material and you isolate a chunk and you flatten it out. Um, but once you get into the rough shape of a knife, then you have to do all the work to finish it. And that involves uh, grinding it down, um, putting the bevels and the edge on it, uh, making a handle for it, and pinning the handle to it. And so that took, uh, that was my first knife and the only knife that I've made. That taken, it took a couple of days, um, just because I'm really new at it. Uh, the biggest item, uh, just biggest by overall size that it takes up now that it's done, is probably probably this. It's not the most impressive for sure. This is a it's a twisting fork. So what you use this for is you put the material in in the vise, and you use this to be able to get good leverage, and then to twist it into a shape, which is what I did for and this material for this thing here. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's large, it's not real attractive, but it does a job. I hope that answers your question. Anything else? Uh, yeah, just one more and I think we will be good. Um, so what kind of advice would you give to someone who is interested in starting out blacksmithing for the first time? Yeah, great question. Um, look nearby, like in your neighborhood or, or city, um, community colleges or trade schools, and sometimes they'll have classes that you can take as a, as a beginner or just an introductory thing um, and see if you like it. Also, there's really great YouTube channels out there. Um, one of my favorite is this excellent blacksmith based out of Colorado. Um, the channel's called uh, Black Bear Forge. Um, He's very, very good. He has a lot of like great tutorials on kind of beginner stuff. In fact, he did a, a series for a whole year where every week he had something called Hook of the Week. And so he made, you know, obviously like the simple types of hooks like this, but also really elaborate things, um, really fascinating. And he, he walks through the process really well. Um, but yeah, if you find a, a class uh, that you can take locally, that's fantastic. If you don't, or there's nothing nearby, um, really you can get started with as simple as um, uh, a blowtorch <laughs> and you don't have to have a real anvil you can just have like a heavy piece of metal so like for example near your foot just there, there's a just a big piece of steel and then a hammer one thing I'd recommend though is a hammer that doesn't have like the carpenter hammer uh, tongs because or tongs or tines whatever they're called because if you're hitting something and it bounces back you don't want those to hit you um, so you can find um, hammers like like this in most hardware stores. And at least like this isn't gonna hurt you if it comes back and hit you, but the carpentry hammers that have the claws, that could be a bit dangerous. Also make sure you have the right uh, protection. So definitely safety glasses. Um, also useful um, are aprons. Um, I'm not too worried about this shirt and I'm kind of used to little tiny burns like that, but an apron is really great, a leather apron. Um, definitely closed toed shoes. Make sure you have fire extinguisher. 
Um, uh, yeah, just try to be safe. Wow. Well, thank you so much for presenting and showing us what you have. Uh, it was an incredible experience to watch everything you were making. And I'm sure we inspired a lot of people to take up a new hobby this summer. Awesome. Yeah, I'm glad. Uh, thanks for spending the time to hang out with me this afternoon. Of course. My pleasure. Great. Thanks for coming by. Yeah.